So I think we can we can start. Hello everyone. Um, this my name is Katerina Anastasiu. I am uh, responsible for Transform Euros, Europe's programs uh, on migration and militarization. Uh, welcome to this webinar that we co-organized with the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, uh, the Office of North Africa, which is based in Tunis, and they're also co-hosting this event uh, in the frame of their festival, Ramadan Firuza. My colleague Ines uh, Mahmoud, uh, in a second, will tell you more about that festival and, uh, and her work. Yes, uh, as I said, um, we are starting now with this webinar. We have three guests that will be introduced later. What I will do now is uh, uh, help you a little bit with the technical stuff. Um, the discussion in total will be about two hours around the latest half of the discussion. We will be open to take uh, questions from the public. If you take a look um, at your Zoom window in the bottom, you will see a Q&A box. If you have questions uh, to the speakers, please take the time and write your questions in there. Uh, if you want to communicate with us, share links and so on, you can always use your chat on the right side. And now I would give the word to Ines to introduce herself. Thanks a lot, Katerina. Uh, my name is Ines Mahmoud. I am Program Manager for Economy and Migration at the North Africa Office of Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. And yes, I'm very happy that today we could uh, co-organize this event on the recent situation of uh, sea rescue in the Mediterranean since the outbreak of the pandemic. Um, we have also hosted uh, two other events this week on the situation of migrants in North Africa, specifically in detention since the outbreak of the pandemic and on our Facebook page you can uh, still also watch um, films, short films on, on migration and uh, find information on other events that are part of our Ramadan program which we are hosting this year. So thank you Ines. Um, I will try to give you a brief introduction to the topic. As Ines uh, mentioned already, what we want to do today is take a look at the work of civic sea rescue missions and how this has changed due to the pandemic. We see exceedingly countries um, not complying with their search and rescue uh, obligations. We see people getting lost um, uh, inside the, the SAR zones of Malta and Italy. We see people in, nor uh, north in the middle Mediterranean um, spending days and days on boats uh, without water and appropriate provisions. So uh, we are going to talk about uh, all this uh, situation, but we're also going to take a look ret retrospectively to sea uh, rescue, to civic sea rescue, and try to figure out uh, how we react to the situation now and why it is important for our future and, um, and so on. Um, Ines will now introduce the speakers. Uh, what we're gonna do is uh, people are gonna, uh, the, our three speakers, uh, Cedric, uh, oh God, Cedric, Lucia and Simeon are gonna have uh, about 10 minutes uh, at the beginning to give their first inputs and then we're gonna go back to a more moderated kind of discussions with questions and answers. And Ines, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Um, we today have three speakers with us who are representing sea rescue missions as well as um, Hot, the hotline Watch the Mediterranean phone, which is also in place for people in distress situations in the Mediterranean. So on the one hand, we will start with uh, Cedric, who is a member of Sea Rescue Mission CI. Um, then there will be uh, Simeon Leisch, who is a member of Watch the Med Alarm Phone and will speak about um, the work of Alarm Phone and also the difficulties faced by in their work since the outbreak of the pandemic. And then Lucia Gennari, who is um, a lawyer and at the same time member of Sea Rescue Mission Mediterranean. And um, as Kat stated before, if you have any questions, if any questions come up also during the presentations that we will hear now, you can just um, write them um, in the chat and they will be asked later. So we will start with you, Cedric. Thank you. 
Um, hello, everybody who are watching us. And thank you, Ines and Katerina, for the invitation today. Um, I actually just came back from the ship and Cody a few days ago, so it's still something really, really fresh for me. So the topic of today is uh, sea rescue in the Mediterranean during the pandemic. And uh, as a film media coordinator for the NGO CI, who is doing search and rescue in the central Mediterranean since 2015, um, I wanted to make a short debrief about the previous mission. So um, first, I think it's important to divide this topic in three categories. Um, the first one is how politicians are delaying and stopping search and rescue NGOs which is um, already a really famous topic. And then the two next categories, which are more relevant to today's context, is like how coronavirus, how coronavirus is uh, impacting the search and rescue NGOs and how politicians are using coronavirus against uh, search and rescue NGOs. So to do so, I wanted to make a debrief of uh, the last mission. And I wanted to start by saying that basically we were really lucky to launch this mission because we managed to gather a team of crew members and volunteers in Boyana Port in Spain on the 10th of March. This happened one day before the first curfew in Spain. So that's basically why uh, we managed to launch this operation. And I think it's one of the biggest problems right now for search and rescue NGOs, the, um, which is of course impacting all the citizens and everybody around the world. So we have to deal with that. We had to find solutions. So um, I've listed a few other problems due to coronavirus. Of course, the shipyard crew who was in Boyana Port in Spain in charge of repairing the ship had to leave earlier because uh, we knew about this travel restriction. And this means that we arrived on the 10th of March and we were able to leave the port only on the 30th of March. So we had delay in the reparation process, but of course we had to finish it. We also had uh, the problems with uh, the food supply delivery, um, going to the market was uh, not possible. So basically, as soon as the Spanish government released the curfew, we had followed uh, strict standards. We have restricted our movement um, outside the port and outside our ship. So um, from the 10th of March, basically, we have been um, doing quarantine, taking quarantine measures inside uh, the Alain Cody ship. Uh, we also had the uh, impact on the media attention. Of course, now everything that is about Central Mediterranean is not uh, so shared in the media unless it's uh, related to coronavirus. So then we left on the port on the 30th of March. We arrived on the southern on the 5th of April. And on the 6th of April in the morning, we received the first message from the alarm phone saying that there was one uh, boat around us. So we went on scene, we launched the ribs. Um, the Libyan militia arrived on scene as well, uh, made dangerous maneuvers around the wooden boat, shot fires, told us to go home, and uh, the people were afraid jumped into the water. So we conducted the rescue operation of 40 to 50 people without life jackets. Everything went well. We were really happy, of course, about this, um, that we had no people dying. And at the end of the, the rescue, the Libyan militia took the wooden boat back to Libya probably to sell it again. At the end of the operation, we received a second message from the alarm phone saying that there was a second wooden boat in, a, in another area. So we went on scene and it's actually quite interesting if you never had this kind of operation. It was around the old rigs and the platforms and the ships. So it was full of activities, but nobody to rescue the wooden boat. So we went on scene. There was already a ship who was in charge of coordinating the rescue operation designed by uh, MRCC. But they denied to conduct the rescue, so we took over. And at the end of the day, we had 150 people on board. So we headed towards uh, Lampedusa and Linus Island, two small Italian islands, to stay on standby. Um, at that time, we didn't know what will happen with the people. Um, basically, I had a conversation with a volunteer where we were thinking, OK, are we going to transfer to disembark the people in Spain or in Greece? We had no idea because in Spain, that's where we came from. And in Greece, because of this uh, new operation called IRINI, uh, it's a European operation that took over the Operation SOFIA. And one of the points was the people rescued by this uh, operation would be disembarked in Greece. So we had limited access to information on the ship because we don't have a lot of internet. 
but we heard about this so we were wondering okay are we going to Greece or to Spain to give you like a how far we were thinking about. But of course, the head of mission and the headquarters who were in charge of uh, finding a quick solution because our job on the ship is basically to care about the guests. But then the headquarters and the head of mission who are in charge of finding a port told us quickly that, of course, we cannot travel. It's not safe. It's actually quite dangerous to travel with 167 people on board. So we just stay on standby waiting for an answer, waiting for a solution for, from Italy or Malta. After a few days, we read on the news that the Italian government was actually willing to find a solution and they wanted to make a transfer from the guest to our from our ship to a ferry. So of course, this was not an official information. It was just what we could read on the media, but we were quite um, confident on their will to find a solution because at that time, we already had one medical evacuation and we had one uh, delivery of food supply, medical supply that went quite smoothly and efficient with the Italian Coast Guard. We also had information that the mayor of Palermo, Orlando, was also actively trying to find a solution. So we were quite um, enthusiastic to this news, of course, but that, that was not official news. That's important to remind. So that means we couldn't share that information to the guests, for example. Because, for example, the media was also saying the transfer will happen in the next few hours. But in the end, the transfer happened after 11 days of waiting. And this uh, probably could have been avoided and put our mission and the, our guests at risk. It's important to remind that we are a small ship. It's 38 meters long. We have only two showers and two toilets and one shower. The people could barely lie down. And one... Um, Basically, we headed towards Palermo because of the weather condition. And therefore, we could see the land from the ship. So this is a really difficult moment for the guests. They are wondering why uh, they have to stay on the ship, why they cannot go to the land. And few of them had access to internet and found out about uh, being transferred. But they were saying this transfer is not good because why should this happen this way? Why are we not transferred to the land and put into a quarantine somewhere? Why do we have to go to a ferry? They were afraid that this ferry would just bring them back to Libya. So this can uh, let you imagine uh, how the uh, condition, the mental condition of the people during those 11 days. So um, we actually had one uh, suicide attempt. We also had someone jumping into the water trying to reach the land. Of course, we brought him back on, on the ship and everybody was safe. We had a second medical evacuation and a second um, um, uh, uh, delivery of supply. On the 17th of April, we had the transfer to the ferry. We were quite happy about it because the team of the Red Cross seemed quite warmful and really happy to, to be present. So that also relieved uh, all of us. And then we spent two weeks into quarantine on the Bay of Palermo. After two weeks, we went on shore to the port and we had the coronavirus test. And after that, we had the port state authorities who controlled the ship um, and uh, its safety. They actually told us that it was not necessary to do the quarantine and the corona check. Uh, it was normally either one or the other, but it's of course, a political move also to delay um, our rescue. So, um, I mean, to bring some timeline back, so basically we left on the 30th of March. That was uh, 36 days ago. And the last people we had uh, with us, so after the rescue, the 6th of April, from the 6th of April till um, the 4th of May when we went to the port, that was 29 days. So we spent 29 days with no contact with the external world, which can give you an aspect on, it's actually twice the amount of a quarantine. So um, they made the report and um, now the ship Alan Kurdi is being detained uh, in Palermo because uh, supposedly it's not safe for the crew members and their guests. The report has been shared to the flag state authority, which is Germany. And the, the authorities in Germany have stated that the safety issues that were found on the ship of Alain Kurdi were actually not a good argument to being detained. And that's actually where we are right now. 
Thank you very much, uh, Cedric. Thank you for your uh, for your description. It's very important also to keep the time the, the time frames in mind when we discuss this, particularly um, what you said about the quarantine. You know, you you said twenty nine days, so double the approximate time. And the question would have been how much danger you would have been in on the ship if if you would uh, actually be unlucky enough to have somebody that was infected also under these conditions. Um, so I would like now to give the word um, to Simeon. Simeon is joining us uh, representing Watchamet Alarm Phone, um, emergency hotline and monitoring mission that has been going on for a couple of years. I guess Simeon will tell us more about it. And he will tell us how their work uh, has changed during the pandemic and what they have been experiencing right now. And Simeon, the microphone is yours. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm happy to join this meeting. Um, I know um, most of you know Alarm Phone, but anyway, I will introduce it a little uh, for those who don't know it. Um, we are now in contact with the people in the central Mediterranean and the other regions of the Mediterranean since more than five years. And the Alarm Phone was founded in 2014, uh, um, uh, <laughs> I guess. And um, it has been founded after a huge ship shipwreck in 2013. Um, where 260 or more than 260 people died um, between Malta and Italy because uh, neither Malta nor Italy were about to rescue, even though there were the uh, possibilities to rescue as there were warships around that could easily have go there. And Malta and Italy, um, it's a conflict we are since then uh, monitoring in the central Mediterranean. Um, but our network um, has grown as the conflict has grown maybe. Uh, we are now more than 200 people all around Europe and North Africa. And we operate a 24 hour hotline for people in distress at sea. Um, to give you an idea, uh, in the last five years, we had more than 3000 uh, calls to the alarm phone from people in distress, uh, which is meaning maybe or probably more than 100,000 people uh, which try to reach Europe um, called out to the alarm phone because um, the official uh, search and rescue uh, centers, the RCCs, like the RCC in Malta, the RCC in Rome, um, are not operative or do not help migrants anymore or just organize their pushbacks as we are witness, witnessing uh, at the moment. Mm. We, when we receive a call by migrants, we try to make pressure on the authorities to rescue the migrants. Some people call us watchdogs of um, and Rome because we face situation and we also treat about the misbehavior by the authorities. And in, with this, we try to visualize the situation in the Met as it is, and we try to raise awareness about the situation because what the states are doing is actually they try to create a void of information and they try, uh, they try to create a black hole kind of, of information so that nobody sees what's going on and um, we try to prevent this from happening this void which is created in the mat this information void um, is now even larger than before um, because during the COVID-19 pandemic, several uh, NGOs are not allowed to operate anymore. As we heard, CI is not uh, able to operate the ship anymore, as well Sea Watch. Um, uh, is not there. 
perhaps uh, civil flight mission to uh, the central mediterranean um your sound is a little bit uh, slow so maybe you you should turn off your camera for a while because uh, we don't hear you that well i'm sorry um yes as well the uh, moonbird mission is not uh, there anymore and this is why we just have nearly no information about the outcome of our cases um we usually inform the authorities after we receive a call from migrants and then authorities um do not give us information but take all the information and um, we have to just relay on what they say but they're saying nothing and this is so when we lose contact to the migrants we are just blind in a way and this is what uh, is the situation at the moment um, this blindness is increasing and um, more it is not clear really what is happening at the moment pushbacks um, happened in the recent days to libya uh, like last week we had a case with 26 27 people who were pushed back to libya and it was nearly impossible to find out what happened to them because nobody is communicating anymore and the search and rescue ngos are not there so we have no clue really um, what we can observe um, in a better way or which is yeah positively is that there are a lot of um, autonomous arrivals on Lampedusa in the recent months mostly from Tunisia but as well from uh, Libya people uh, arrive on Lampedusa and this shows that people cannot be stopped from the journeys but they are preparing better and better and um, they will make their way to Euro Europe though there is no rescue and they will go to the, the sea even though there is no rescue mm, in the beginning of april malta and italy declared their ports for unsafe um, which changed the situation in a way because now uh, Malta is even refusing taking people uh, ashore and they are keeping them in, may, some people call it floating hotspots. Um, it's a uh, pleasure vessels off the coast of Malta and they try to pressure Europe to take those people in. And that's kind of a bit a difficult, uh, different situation than in it Italy where people are just in quarantine and after the quarantine on the ferries they will be brought to the land or brought ashore. And in Malta, it's not clear yet what will happen to those people. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Simon, um, for your contribution. And I think on that note, you also briefly spoke about the situation in Italy and Malta. And we will continue with Lucia, who, as I said previously, is a lawyer, but at the same time also member of Sea Rescue Mission Mediterranea. And she will speak about the difficulties that the Sea Rescue Mission encountered since the outbreak of the pandemic. But at the same time, she will later also probably have the chance to um, be more that so to say, uh, speak about also the legal implications uh, that the recent um, situation actually um, has on, on migrants crossing to um, Italy and Malta. So thank you, Lucia. Thank you for inviting me. Um, as you said, I'm part of uh, Mediterranea, which is uh, actually not an NGO, but uh, it has been uh, called more a non-governmental action. Uh, it was uh, the product, the result of uh, different groups of, from civil society gathering together 
and um, succeeding in buying a ship, the Mare Ionio, uh, which has been monitoring and also uh, doing uh, rescues in the Mediterranean since 2000, the end of 2018. So when the situation in Italy from like uh, migration policies point of view where it was kind of different uh, from the one we are facing now, but not so different at the end of the day. Uh, and um, as I said, uh, we have this ship called Mare Ionio, which has been uh, uh, stopped for many months uh, from the end of August last year uh, until February this year, because of the application of the uh, security beast decree uh, sanctions over search and rescue organizations. Uh, so uh, they un unfairly and we say illegitimately uh, confiscated the ship, which is now free, but at the same time facing the same problems that were uh, mentioned by Cedric. Uh, so uh, how to get to the ship, uh, form a crew uh, in the pandemic times. So uh, with all the restrictive measures towards uh, freedom of movement for everybody, um, and um, when the ship will be uh, at sea again, probably facing the same problem that CI, uh, but also Aitamari uh, faced uh, during the last weeks and, and months. Um, so Mediterranea is a peculiar kind of organization which needs support from an economical point of view, so we will have uh, uh, the website mentioned in the chat and you can visit and also donate if you want. Uh, but to get back to our uh, issue, um, which are the problems that are faced now for search and rescue organization? They come from uh, misuse of the uh, pandemic by uh, the Italian and Maltese government, first uh, of all. Um, which have uh, for the moment done a different kind of um, measures and, and practices to, to uh, slow down and, and at the end prevent uh, pri like uh, civil society organizations to be active uh, at sea. So what do they do? Uh, they make NGOs ship stay in ports for the longest time as possible. Uh, or any way to make missions very slow. So standoffs, which means like uh, the period you have to wait before uh, getting a solution for rescued people is really, really long. Uh, it was uh, something that started um, in the Salvini times, but it's something that is still happening. There is the issue of quarantine, uh, both for migrants and for uh, rescue NGOs. Um, finally ended with detention, let's say. Um, if I have time, I can explain better these steps. There are the, 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 the government decrees uh, which declared uh, unsafe Italian and Maltese ports. Uh, I will go deeper in this too. And at the end of the day, there is uh, the following of a policy which started a long time ago, uh, of externalization of uh, Europe. European uh, borders also at sea. So that means a delegation to uh, North African authorities, basically the Libyans, but also the Tunisians, um, to, um, to perform uh, interception or search and rescue activities in the Mediterranean. Uh, and also late, like now it's more clear than before, uh, the delegation to private vessels to do uh, rescues, which is somehow a uh, duty also for states to delegate some sometimes their activity the activities of search and rescue but this time is misused both to perform pushbacks to libya or to make these standoffs more silent um, and this is something we are seeing these days um, i want to explain a bit uh, these measures that have been taken i think the more um, uh, the more uh, notorious and, and maybe uh, it's interesting to know what do they say are these decrees that um, declared uh, Italian and Maltese ports unsafe. Um, Italy was the first one to release such kind of decree. It's an interministerial decree uh, which was released and published uh, on the 7th of April this year and uh, um, which was followed uh, some days later by uh, like a similar kind of act by the Maltese government. 
but I know more the Italian one, and, uh, but the logic uh, is the same. It's a way to um, avoid the problem of dealing with uh, search and rescue activity, but mainly with the part concerning the disembarkation. And this is a way to use, uh, we can see it as a way to use this moment, the sanitary emergency, um, as a way to um, negotiate uh, at the European level uh, the, the issue of uh, migration management. So um, with this decrease, uh, Italy um, declared that uh, due to the, cri the emergency, the, the, the sanitary crisis, um, Italian ports were not safe in the sense that uh, from one side uh, people uh, who arrived couldn't be, could, couldn't be attended uh, in a proper manner from a sanitary point of view, but at the same time that the arrival of people is, can, can be considered as a threat um, for the uh, Italian sanitary system itself. And this is uh, something which will uh, concern people who are not all rescued people, also because we need to uh, consider the fact that, uh, as uh, Simeon was, was saying, uh, we have more and more autonomous uh, landings uh, in Italy, in Lampedusa, but also in Sicily. And um, uh, it's just about people who are rescued by foreign uh, ships, so ships not flagging the Italian flag, uh, and not in the Italian SAR zone. So it's like uh, two elements which are totally uh, casual. Uh, it's not something that has a specific logic, which is uh, outside the uh, common frame um, uh, with, uh, regarding uh, foreign NGOs bringing uh, illegal migrants to, to Italy. Um, and for these people, um, Ports are not safe, it, all the Italian ports will not be considered safe according to international law of the sea, which is uh, very questionable, um, for all the period of the emergency, uh, of the sanitary emergency. So at least uh, until the end of July this year, but I think they also extended it. So uh, it's a very long period and includes uh, summer, uh, which will be uh, really problematic. Um, this, uh, this um, decree was followed by another one, which uh, it's, uh, it can seem a bit contradictory to, with this, uh, and uh, through which it was assigned uh, the task of uh, dealing with, this impact, with uh, rescued people uh, for which Italy can't be considered a safe place, um, which states that for these people, we, I mean, for example, the people who were rescued by CI, um, they, they are not allowed to disembark, but they have to have uh, to do a quarantine period on another ship, which has um, no logic from a, also an economical point of view. Uh, and, and it's very strong from a symbolic uh, perspective, of course, and also entails a lot of problems, traumas, and, and so on uh, for people who were rescued, as Cedric uh, already, already said. Moreover, also NGO ships have to do this quarantine period in a way that is uh, different from the way um, uh, people have to deal with the, with the COVID measures uh, when they arrive to Italy. Uh, I mean that there is a discrimina discriminatory attitude uh, and a, a different way to treat uh, rescue NGOs from other kind of ships or people in general or foreign people who want to uh, enter Italy in this uh, emergency time. And this is also something that uh, uh, we need to consider when we look at these kind of measures. Finally, um, to, to speak a moment about uh, CI situation, which probably will be the same situation in which other ships uh, will be, uh, will found themselves uh, in the next future, uh, the, the detention. Um, I, I, I make this uh, because um, it's not a real detention, it's, um, it's the result of an inspection um, during which it is asked to rescue NGOs to uh, respond to um, um, requirements, safety requirements, um, which uh, are thought not according to the kind of ship that they are, but to the kind of ship that they think 
um, NGO rescue ship should, uh, should have. It's a bit complicated, but it's just to say that it's a way, an administrative way to deal with uh, um, these kind of ships, uh, which is not new from, um, uh, again, from a political perspective, and um, it's in the logic of the code of conduct, uh, which have been uh, already used or uh, they are thinking to use on a European level, and uh, which uh, um, aim at the end of uh, to, to prevent uh, rescue NGOs to, to be present at sea. I think I stop in case I'm, it's 10 minutes now. Thank you, Lucia. We're going to come back to you anyway, but thank you very much. Um, I will now open a little bit the format. Uh, so instead of having these 10 minutes inputs, we're going to be asking questions, Ines and I, and addressing one of the speakers or, or all of them, depending on the question. So um, the first question would go to Cedric. I mean, you've touched upon it already um, during your input. And uh, I, if, uh, if I'm right, uh, going briefly through the Q&A, uh, a couple of people asked about this. Um, does it actually, does the pandemic or even before the pandemic do, um, uh, let's say, a very hostile conditions stop people from taking the decision to get on a boat and come try to cross the Mediterranean? And how does um, this situation really affect people on the move? What happens to them? Would you uh, talk with us? And of course, I mean, it's the uh, uh, Alan Kurdi was the last ship of the civic rescue missions uh, that was operative. So it would be super if you would answer this question. So we have Alan Kurdi, but we also have Aita Mary, who was just after us, actually. So. Um, as a, as a volunteer for search and rescue NGO, I don't know about what's happening in Libya, as in it's also an argument being used by politicians against uh, individuals and search rescue NGOs. Therefore, I have no contact with what's happening in Libya. And the only thing I can say basically is what I can read on, on reports online. So there is one really nice called the Torture Factory, and it says that 85% of the 3,000 people interviewed who reached Italy from Libya had been subjected to torture, violence, and inhuman treatments. So that's a good way to show what's happening there. And uh, of course, when the people, when we conduct the rescue operation, we can uh, see and hear that. Um, we have one doctor and one human rights observer who are in charge of assessing the medical conditions of the guests and um, on certain scenario, take also the stories of the guests. And of course, we can see the marks, we can see the scars on the face, we can see broken fingers, we can see marks of burning, of heating, etc., etc. So I can just, um, by this experience on the ship, I says that what it says on the report is actually true. And basically, we also hear about kidnapping, about uh, people uh, being there, getting their passport destroyed in front of them. And that's actually the idea is that a lot of people from Africa, from Asia, travel to Libya to travel in Libya, to work in Libya. They wanted to make money in Libya, to work there, to get some money to send back to the family. Most of the interview or the discussion we had, the people did not want to go to Europe at first. That was the only way to leave the country because the borders are closed, because there is a civil war, civil war ongoing. And because of course, when you are part of the lowest class, you are the one the most affected by it. So I think it's something important to say, to break down a bit the cliches that the people actually did not think to go to Europe. They were just forced to. Um, and basically what they told us is that they are going on the ship because it's either freedom or dying, but both solutions are good solutions for them. So that shows you like why they don't want to stay in Libya and why they are also forced to take those ships to embarkations to go to Europe. Um, of course, um, there is also another side because of coronavirus um, to come back to the question. Right now, there is no more rescue operation ongoing in Central Mediterranean. Uh, we have talked already about it. But I think one of the big problems as well is that there is no more monitoring uh, on the Central Mediterranean. So we have seen, uh, like I was saying earlier, the Libyan militia has uh, not working anymore because um, the Libyan authorities stated that their port were not safe anymore. So we have seen 
uh, Libyan ships being stuck at the port and not allowed to disembark. I don't know how this evolved in the future. Again, I just came back from the ship and I had limited access to internet, but from what I understood, there were ships from the Libyan authorities who were stuck on the port and were not allowed to uh, disembark the people. So in the end, if the militias are not allowed to uh, do their work uh, as a pullback, that means the people will maybe be more willing to, tra to travel because they won't face um, pullback. Then we have seen also the change of the European, the European uh, operation, Sofia, who has moved to the operation Irene. And one of the changes that this operation will happen more eastern side of Libya, which is one of the parts where there is no crossing, uh, which is made uh, on purpose, of course, uh, to not rescue those boats. Then, of course, we have seen the NGOs who are not able to work anymore um, because of politicians' measures, because of coronavirus. Um, like uh, Simon said uh, quickly, there is no more aircraft as well, like a moonbird, because of the same reasons. And there are merchandise ships, but it's not their work to conduct rescue. So this can bring actually quite dangerous uh, operation, uh, rescue operation. We, I think if um, the people who are watching us don't know about this topic, they can watch Forensic Architecture. And they are doing great work with um, investigations on, on those kind of situations. And we have uh, Frontex, which I think is still working, and they have an aircraft, but um, I don't think they are willing to collaborate with search and rescue NGOs. I don't know about that. Maybe Simon, uh, Simon will be able to talk about it. So we have seen like uh, also the dangerous measures taken by the southern countries, uh, such as Malta. And again, I'm sure um, Simon will be able to talk more in depth uh, about this topic. Thanks a lot. Um, our next question actually is for Simeon, because we have um, already spoken about this briefly, but in the past uh, weeks we have seen many boats being pushed back to North African shores, especially Libya. And we wanted to know, do you know what situation awaits migrants who are being pushed back to Libya actually? And at the same time, within the past years, uh, we have um, observed a lot of pressure also on North African countries, for example, specifically Tunisia to implement, for example, a new asylum law um, or um, discussions on disembarkation platforms. Um, do you think that there is an intention to externalize uh, the European um, border further and that this means also, of course, a criminalization of uh, search and rescue missions? Thank you. Um, yes, of course, uh, the European Union is keen to externalize the borders or to Europeanize the borders in Africa. Maybe you could say it like this because externalization always sounds like now we do not have nothing to do with it anymore, but it's just the, the opposite. Europe is going more and more into the North African countries and trying to pressure more and more on those countries to um, keep the migrants. And this issue is um, interconnected to the autonomous arrivals. Maybe I can answer the question here. Um, there are several autonomous arrivals in Italy, um, as Lucia said, in Sicilia, but also in Lampedusa. In Lampedusa in May, there were more than 500 people arriving autonomously. Um, and this is quite a huge number or yeah depends on with, with which you compare it but the numbers of autonomous arrivals are rising and um, Italy is seems to be a bit scared about it and they are trying to pressure Tunisia to intercept more people especially Tunisians um, which are often the people who reached Lampedusa then. Um, on the border externalization issue, um, the step with the, um, or the idea of the, or imagination of the uh, Libyan Tsar zone, uh, which was forced by the European Union, is um, 
a good hint on uh, what they are trying to do. They are trying to um, implement um, tools that allow them to have clean hands um, and saying we are not responsible anymore. And this is the way how they try to um, get the dirty work, maybe say it like this, done by people that are not Europeans or that are only connected to Europeans via B-national uh, meetings or things like this. And as we could observe in um, the Malta cases around Easter, there are um, incredible uh, interconnections between um, Maltese government and uh, Libyan um, militias to bring back people to uh, Libya. Um, they even have um, boats to um, like the um, Dar al Salam to just bring people back to Libya. Um, and this was secret, a secret deal between Malta and, uh, or between some people in Malta and some people in Libya. And yeah, maybe this is the way how, how they will do it, or this is the way they are doing it. And concerning the question of the um, people that were stuck in the harbor in Tripoli, um, this was, as far as I know, just a really short situation where people were not allowed to go ashore for around uh, 10 hours. And afterwards they were allowed and it was kind of a discussion between dif different militias in Libya, as far as I understood it. Um, as there is no really government or no really um, one, one lead in Libya, there are always this kind of discussions between militias, between um, rulers who um, have the power over these detention centers and so on and so forth. And, um, this is always not um, super easy. Um, on the question of coronavirus and um, Libya, um, we had a case in the beginning of the coronavirus where Libya refused to act because they said they don't have protection gear and they didn't go out and uh, rescue the people. And in the end, the people uh, were rescued to Europe, but um, now we are observing again that uh, European or Frontex planes uh, spot the boats and the uh, uh, Libyan authorities intercept them. So things are now again on a usual, I would say, level. Concerning the question if Libya is intercepting boats. Um, Simon, would you would you explain because it was asked also already what uh, what do you mean uh, when you say autonomous arrivals? I think it was a term that everybody has used until now, and obviously for some people in the audience this is not clear. Would you? Ah, sorry, explain? yes, yes, I, I wanted to do it. Um, autonomous arrivals. Um, we count autonomous arrivals as people who make it to the shore without help by. Um, Coast Guards or search and rescue NGOs or people who reach really close to the shore and are spotted first when they reach maybe 20 nautical miles from the shore and then are escorted to uh, Sicily or Lampedusa. Yes. Yeah, that, that was very clear. Thank you very much. Um, now I would like to put a question on the floor for everyone. Um, everyone here, I mean, by now we have tens of thousands of deaths in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, already some projects um, that try to document, uh, but also monitor the situation have been mentioned. Mm, I would like to have a, a, a little bit of a debate on, the, on a more ethical plane, so to say. I mean, even um, the ship of uh, CI took its name by Alan Kurdi. Alan Kurdi was this two-year-old two boy that was washed up in the shores of um, in the shores of Turkey back in 2015. Uh, it was uh, actually the, this picture was so shocking. It was mediatized at this moment um, very heavenly. But um, we do know that a lot of people that lose their lives um, on sea um, are 
practically forgotten. Uh, and the question is, how how do we? I mean, um, of course, people that that engage in sea rescue engage in sea rescue out of the premise that nobody should die if help uh, would be possible. So how do we deal with this grief? There are projects, like there is a project um, in Tunisia in a city called Terzis, where fishermen have created um, the cemetery of the unnamed for people that, uh, whose bodies have been washed up. They, they keep collecting personal items. Also as well, trying to, to curate a data bank that would make it possible to relatives to, to find the people they lost. Um, we know that there are some you know, projects that are similar in Italy. Now also, from what I know personally, the people in Catania working in the morgue are quite active in taking care of, of the remains. But the general question to everybody is, um, does anybody care in Europe? I mean, do you have the feeling that uh, the grief is powerful enough uh, to, to support more understanding and more solidarity towards these people and sea rescue respectively. So I don't know which one of you would like to say a couple of words. Maybe Lucia. I don't know if I'm the right person to answer this question and I will shortly leave the word to somebody else. Um, yeah, in Italy there are organizations who deal with these um, specific issues. I'm, I'm not really part, I'm not part of them, so I think maybe there is also someone in the audience who can say more than I can. Um, and yeah, from, yeah, I can say for example from my perspective, uh, um, it is something which is uh, very meaningful to deal with and can also um, lead to the um, building construction of legal actions for um, families of people who died at sea uh, or who get injured uh, during their turnings. And this is true both from a criminal perspective and it's something that happened because, for example, there is a, an important trial going on for what concerned the shipwreck uh, which happened in 2013 and after which the alarm phone has uh, been created and also for other cases and, uh, and also from a, a civil law perspective. So um, it is possible to ask for, it, it sounds bad, but it's something which is previewed by the law to have a compensation for the loss that have been suffered. So uh, this from my harried uh, legal perspective. It was more than enough, I think. Um, okay, I guess it's a topic that is quite uncomfortable, but it was important for us to put it on the table. I'm, uh, and uh, I would give the microphone now to Ines uh, for the next question. Yes. So, I mean, about the next question, we actually already spoke, but um, as we know, it is not just now within the time of COVID-19, but also in the previous years that sea rescue has been heavily criminalized, um, ship confiscations, claims about the safety of naval vessels, uh, delays in the workflows, um, exhaustion of the financial capacities of civic uh, rescue missions, seem to be a strategy also used to hinder sea rescue missions uh, from operation. And I mean, this question I think was also asked in the Q and A. Um, how is it possible to resist this repression and what are also forms of support and uh, transnational uh, national solidarity uh, for sea rescue missions? And we also wanted to add, uh, have you actually received any support by international organizations like UNHCR, IOM, etc. in this context? Um, I, I would ask it, um, I would ask uh, Cedric uh, to answer and then maybe Lucia, yes? Um, so probably Lucia would bring the legal aspect uh, to that. Of course we received um, funding from uh, people and from NGOs. Um, basically, Ancodi, like uh, Lucia says, is detained uh, at port. The same for Aitamari. 
So that means we cannot conduct a search and rescue uh, operation. To give um, an idea, basically, this is a well-known um, issue, a well-known uh, technique used by politicians to delay us from doing operation. And uh, maybe to give more insights, basically, when we are um, blocked at the port, we still need to pay uh, to stay at the port. And this has a cost, and the cost is 2,000 euro per day. So it gives you a better idea on uh, what is the strategy from politicians. Basically, the idea is like they are going to delay us as much as long as possible. So we have to pay, and then at a certain point, we won't be able to pay anymore. And that's what happened to previous cases where the boat get uh, saved. So um, what I can say, because we are a lot of people listening, and I think uh, there is actually a strong network of solidarity that is sometimes not visible, but still quite active. Um, we need to, to follow the page, to support, to share the hashtag. Now we have uh, free Alan Kurdi and free uh, Aitamari. I have a thought for all my friends who are still on the ships, because I don't know if I say it, but as a volunteer, I'm allowed to, to leave the ship because I'm a guest on board. But the seafarers who are uh, professionals uh, must stay on the ship until they get released from their functions and they get replaced by other people. But of course, with all the ongoing situation, they are still there. So I have also a thought for them at the moment. And um, well, I mean, that's it, like um, to support us to um, by volunteering, by donating, by being proactive. It doesn't need to be on the ship. It can also be at home, sharing the information to friends and family. It's how um, this kind of uh, support is growing, is basically sharing the message and trying to get a lot of people being involved. Okay. Uh, yeah, for what concerns the support of international organizations, uh, and I think you mean like the governative organization like uh, the Council of Europe, the UNHCR, and so on. Um, there has been also uh, strong support also concerning in specific cases. And this is true uh, when we see the reports that uh, has been uh, published, both on um, search and rescue activities and their criminalization, and also for what concern, and this is really crucial, the situation in Libya. No? They, are, they have the possibility to document and to uh, provide for an institutional um, opinion on what's happening and this is um, it, this has been done uh, in the in, in this period and it has been useful if we think for example uh, there is a letter by uh, six different UN special rapporteurs concerning the first uh, directive which was released by the Ministry of Interior in Italy against the Mare Ionio, for example, which was followed by many other directives of, uh, of the same kind. And they were um, underlining um, something that we also uh, want to all the time underline, also from a juridical perspective. And that is that there has been like a reversed, um, a reversed perspective of the search and rescue dynamic, which led to, and I want to um, explain a bit because this can be, uh, not very clear. Uh, I mean that the, the directives from the Ministry of Interior in Italy, the new laws that has been um, that entered into force during the last years, and also this last um, X that has been taken by the Italian and Maltese government, they all start from a, a reverse uh, dynamic. That means that search and rescue activities, and especially the last part of the search and rescue activity, which is the disembarkation of people in a safe place, has been framed as a way to smuggle people, okay? A way to make uh, undocumented migrants, possible terrorists, uh, uh, arrive to the European, and specifically the Italian and Maltese uh, coasts. While what we think that uh, it's really uh, against international law, both law, law of the sea and human rights law, which is non-intervening uh, when there is a duty to do that, non-coordination between states, pushback by proxy, 
uh, even sometimes violent acts has been framed as like a police. It's, uh, it's like the, um, the, the managing uh, migration fl fluxes, let's say. Uh, and it's something which has been, uh, which states, especially Italy and Malta, but with the full support of the European Union and therefore of the other member states and the European institutions, first of all, the European Commission, um, they are uh, like seen as politi uh, acts of politics um, and, and a way to avoid responsibilities, which we think uh, it's not uh, what it's not successful because at the end of the day there is a chain of responsibility that can be reconstructed also through the use of legal actions. Actually I think what we might do now is um, because there was a short question on um, people missing at the borders maybe we will do this now with Simeon and then we get to another legal question that I have uh, for, for you Latia. So, um, Simeon, you said that you could, uh, you could briefly speak about the subject of, um, yeah, persons uh, missing on the borders. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, for the alarm phone, it was, and it still is an important issue because we do have contact with uh, a lot of people who call us and are searching for relatives, beloved ones, and they do not know what happened to them because of the information or non-information of European and uh, African actors. And um, the alarm phone um, is, uh, if we get calls like this, we try to investigate what happened to them and often we can help actually. Um, but what we find is really important is that people are not alone and interconnect because uh, there are so many stories um, which are similar to each other and so many people are missing uh, their children, fathers, sisters, um, because um, they tried to reach Europe and they uh, did not succeed and we don't know or they don't know where they are anymore. And um, we are an activist network. And um, for me, this um, network uh, type of um, connection between us is a really strong link and is really supportive. And um, as it is for the alarm phone, it is for uh, borderline Europe, and uh, not borderline Europe, missing at the borders, um, where people interconnect and families interconnect who uh, lost um, family members. And there were several meetings and um, between those, and it's a quite strong um, group now, which can um, help a lot about the loss and the people can tell their stories, which helps as well. And it would be super cool, or it would be really important to make these stories more visible in Europe. And as Alarm Phone, we tried to organize um, something in February uh, where uh, mm, yeah, an, an attack on migrants in um, Morocco um, held the sixth anniversary um, where more than 10 people, if I remember right, uh, died. Uh, they tried to swim to Spain or to the enclaves because they were shot in the water. Uh, but it's really difficult to raise awareness for these issues as, um, yeah, I'm not sure why, but it's really difficult. Thanks Thank a you. lot. Um, yes, so I just had another short question for Lucia. I mean, in your introduction, actually you spoke also about the legal implications in Italy specifically, um, but, would you probably be able to elaborate a bit further on this and also on what is happening in Malta actually um, within, the, within the past weeks and uh, the legal measures taken basically, especially in these two thousand southern Mediterranean countries uh, that um, make um, sea rescue uh, very difficult recently? Uh, you mean the measures that have been taken in these months with the COVID or in general in the last year? 
Exactly. Obviously, it is an ongoing situation within the last years, but specifically in, in, in these months, because obviously you also as a legal expert um, could, um, yeah, could elaborate on this in, in, in more detail maybe for us to understand um, what are the specific implications now that make it even more difficult. Uh, yeah, um, as I said, the first, uh, the, concerning the, 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 emer the COVID emergency period, um, the things, the, the juridical measures that has been taken both by Italy and, and Malta is this um, decree that declares parts unsafe. Also here there is a reversion of the concept of safety uh, because um, international law of the sea uh, described like the um, place where pe sh shipwrecked people has to be, have to be disembarked also in the um, fastest uh, time as possible to release the rescue ship from its obligation towards uh, rescued people. Um, uh, it's uh, the so-called place of safety, which is uh, um, described by international law of the sea uh, in some, um, um, let's say the international law of the sea is a, it's a huge uh, group of different uh, tools, conventions, uh, treaties and soft law um, so it's a, a really big uh, um, say, mix of different um, legal instruments um, and it is uh, described by the guidelines, guidelines of treatment of people uh, rescued at sea, which is a document released by the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, as the place where people uh, who has been rescued um, uh, meet, can meet their basic human needs. Um, and where uh, SAR operations, search and rescue operations, are considered to be finished. So search and rescue operations don't finish until people is disembarked on land, okay, not in another ship. Um, and so the concept of safety from this uh, perspective on international mar maritime law uh, is referred to the safety of the rescued people, okay. Uh, also, when you talk about migration at sea and, and the rescue of migrant people fleeing from, for the, in this case, is Libya, but also uh, from other countries, you have to take in consideration also another branch of law, which is uh, human rights law and asylum law. So uh, even though international maritime law doesn't specifically refer, and, and it's not always true also, uh, states has to consider um, the specific situation of rescued people who have a right to be rescued um, all the time uh, without considering their uh, juridical status. No? So um, uh, in this case, Malta and Italy considered safety on the other way around of their um, systems and also excluded an evaluation case by case. They say all the people in, in the Italian case, all the people rescued by foreign ships um, and in outside the Italian star zone. But anyway, and, and for the Maltese, I didn't read the, the decree, but I think it, it doesn't specify anything about that. So all the people who are rescued at sea uh, are like a threat uh, uh, and, and Maltese ports can all the ports for a lot and indefined period uh, can't be considered safe. So um, this is the, the, the first thing that has been used, not in a league, so we can also, um, we need to think about this kind of uh, um, legal tools that has been used, not uh, being uh, coherent and, and respectful uh, um, for what concerns higher principle and higher norm that comes from international law, okay? And, and this is what we are saying um, from diff in, in different ways. Um, I, I hope, and so this is the first uh, and main uh, tool. And then there is softer, let's say, tools like quarantine uh, for migrant people and for um, rest, search and rescue uh, ships. Um, from the NGOs. Um, the standoff is also something <laughs> which is uh, really uh, problematic uh, because uh, what I mean, I mean that um, obliging a ship which has performed a rescue to stay at sea, out at sea for a long period because I don't remember CI was staying there more than 10 days maybe. Um, Aitamari also more than one week. Um, it's very dangerous both for the crew and for rescued people. 
um, because also if the ship is very equipped uh, from a, a sanitary point of view, that doesn't mean that the uh, people can really be attended and also you have to consider uh, the, the background of the people. They are fleeing from different difficult situations, often suffered torture, and, and so there's a lot of things that can be held in the reality of a, of a ship. Also, if it would uh, be a very big and, and luxury ship, uh, I would say. Um, so uh, by obliging uh, the ships of, to stay outside the ports for many days, uh, not only they commit uh, an, uh, an illicit from a, a legal perspective, uh, if we consider the European Convention of Human Rights or other, um, or other conventions, it's also a way to, um, to, to obstacle uh, rescue ships. But it's not new at all. Okay, this is something uh, that has been uh, already used a lot. And yeah, I would say that during the quarantine, these are the, do, during the COVID uh, emergency, these are the, um, the, the, the measures that have been taken. Then they, you, you have to consider also the older um, changes in the law that has been uh, taken by previous governments and which are still all, all there. Thank you, Lucia. Um, now I would like to, to discuss with Simon, but also maybe uh, you too, Cedric and Lucia would also like to add to that. I mean, um, going back to how sea rescue is being framed in this process of criminalization or degradation of, of the cause, so to say. Um, I mean, there have been a lot of politicians, a lot of publications referring to sea rescue as a pull factor. We have seen particularly in the two cases that became quite famous previous year with uh, Carola Raquette and Pia Clem, uh, you know, there were even big newspapers saying that uh, as long as sea res rescue is in place, more people <laughs> will come. So this is the, the, the one uh, argument that is being constructed against sea rescue. But in overall, we see that throughout, um, throughout Europe and the European borders, but not only the border regions, this is exactly the same when it comes to Balkan countries or Central Europe or even France and so on. Um, the border crossing per se is considered uh, a threat. No, so most of the most of the measures that are met to stop migratory flows are actually based on on the concept of saving the sovereignty of a state. In Greece, it was particularly shocking. Just um, to refresh also the memory of the audience, just uh, one week, uh, two weeks before the COVID pandemic broke really out, we had the the standoff at the border between uh, Turkish and. Um, riot police and Greek uh, riot police. We had far right uh, neo-fascists attacking people of solidarity and migrants. We had two people being shot. This was actually, by the way, also quite good documented by forensic architecture. So the question is, since we see, we do see this pattern, no? How, what do we do to react to this? How, um, how do we answer and um, what steps do we, do we take to counteract this narrative that makes out of unarmed people a threat and out of full gear armed vessels a uh, security mechanism. And I would like Simeon to perhaps uh, have his take first. And if any of you would like to say something, it would be great as well. Uh, thank you. Of course, this is an uh, incredible. Um, difficult question to answer and um, I think there are not, there's not only one answer but um, thousands and um, we have to fight on all the um, narratives that are quite old these are um, just I would say classic um, racist arguments mostly and um, the pull factor especially it's a if you have a look at it it's a crazy argument because it says um, uh, people um, people should not have an easy way or people should not uh, go the safest way to Europe or to safety but people ha should have to risk their lives and um, it is um, 
I, I, I do not see the point in what is criminal about aiding people to um, get to, to safety. And it's, um, it's mostly, um, we, I think we have to see why the people argue like this. And the, the question why they argue like this is because they do not have answers on how to organize society maybe, but mostly I think because of racist um, ideas and ideologies in their head. And um, we have to change these ideologies um, by telling stories about humans mostly, I think. And we are as well often talking about numbers. And um, I think we, there is a question in the, in the chat referring to what uh, do we as search and rescue NGOs, or we are not an NGO, and, um, but we are a network, uh, do to um, what are our ideas. And from Alarm Phone uh, and Mediterranea is also part of this. There is an initiative called Palermo Platform Charter Process, um, which I think is really promising. Um, it's linked to the Solidarity City movement. And I think, uh, or from my point of view, this um, idea of solidarity cities and solidarity regions that can implement um, much better um, um, the measures that have, have to be taken to have an open borders and um, yeah, shut down the European border regime. Um, this is something we should really focus on and um, support with our uh, infrastructure. Uh, Cedric, would you like to share your thoughts on that as well? Uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of narratives, um, personally, I would say there is no way to fight against narratives because people can always make their own stories and there are thousands of different narratives from um, refugees, migrants are eating their child and burning people. I mean, like, <laughs> so um, I think there is no way to find those narratives um, unless maybe bringing more, uh, convincing people to act. Um, to become active, to become part of the story. Um, and then generally what happens is that those people who have seen by themselves, who have the experience, will share to their friends and family. And only when a friend or someone from the family who is not aware about this situation, who might be uh, from far right movement, fascist or whatever, hear that a colleague or friend or family has been doing something in favor of uh, this uh, situation and has brought positive feedback, then they are going to trust that person and to maybe change their mind. So I think it's really on the local level that we can change the narrative uh, only with individuals. And that's also why I don't want to lose my time with people that I don't know who are racist because I will never change their mind by bringing arguments but only when you have people next to you that knows you, you can bring something a bit more personal. So generally we try to uh, humanize, to talk about the people, not the numbers, to bring, uh, okay, what was the profession of the people, why they flew, why, and by humanizing is also a way of bringing more understanding and uh, empathizing a bit more. Thank you, Cedric. Lucia, maybe also you have two sentences for us on that question. <laughs> I, I don't have, uh, ah, sorry, um, a lot to add. Um, as Simon said, uh, we are, but our um, idea at the beginning, okay, I restart. Um, we, as Mediterranean, the idea was uh, since the beginning to have like um, um, a, a political voice uh, to add a bit uh, to the um, dynamic of uh, search and rescue and uh, uh, racist speech uh, and the political moves of the government, uh, of the different governments, uh, because uh, they changed, but the attitude remained uh, um, the same with more radical steps or less radical steps or 
more shouted uh, attitude, but um, the, 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 the logic of the policies towards migration at sea remained uh, more or less uh, the same. And uh, the, the sea had become, uh, in the last years, a very uh, political um, area, um, I would say, a conflictual one, where you couldn't only make uh, humanitarian uh, actions without thinking that they were neutral. And this is uh, something that we wanted really to, to underline through our uh, practice of being, um, being at sea uh, at the time and, and hopefully also in the future. And this was also uh, an attempt to change the narrative uh, on, on the topic of uh, migration and specifically of migration at sea. But uh, Mediterranean also always described uh, itself as uh, like a double phase uh, action, which uh, acts uh, at sea, but a lot also on land, of course, uh, with migrants um, and, and for the rest, I share uh, all the things that have been uh, said. Uh, yeah, I don't have uh, a lot to add. Thank you. Yes, we have one last question actually for everyone. I mean, many within this recent pandemic are talking a lot about things to get back to a form of normality. However, within also the subject that we are discussing today, the normality, so to say, for people crossing the Mediterranean has also in the past years been a permanent state of exception. And um, our question was a bit, I mean, this was answered, answered also already um, partly, but which measures would need to be taken, especially by the EU, to ensure that the lives of people on boats in distress in the Mediterranean are not put at risk? and that the responsibility for search and rescue and international law is being respected. I mean, maybe Lucia, you want to start? Uh, there's a number of things that could be put in place. Um, of course, first one would be not to delegate anymore this activity to especially the so-called Libyan authorities um and this is uh, this passed through also a recon to, from reconsidering uh the the legitimacy itself of the existence in this uh, historical moment of uh, libyan sar zone and uh, i remember that uh, that this is possible the existence of the libyan sar zone and the existence of the libyan Coast Guard and, and, this, uh, and this structure, it exists only because uh, it's uh, supported financially and also from an operational point of view by the European states. So this should stop immediately. Um, and of course, uh, imagining uh, another way of behaving at sea uh, would be important because uh, we have seen so far that um, European uh, state ships have been uh, uh, stuck uh, in the ports, uh, let's say. So uh, the EU operations uh, are uh, mainly working through air assets, which, uh, which are de facto cooperating with the Libyan authorities so they can intercept migrant boats. This is something which has been documented. Also, uh, it, it has been said explicitly, for example, by the Frontex director um, in many occasions. Um, Italian Coast Guard ships, uh, which used to, to be part on, of uh, operations that were anyway uh, part of military or uh, safety operation, but also performed a lot of uh, rescues in the past. They, they don't do it anymore. Um, so uh, the presence of uh, European ships uh, would be of help, of course. Um, and of course, stop preventing uh, NGO ships of performing their activities uh, would be crucial, at least for a, a small uh, part of what, what is in general migration at sea, because of course we have a small amount of, rescue, uh, of NGO rescue ships uh, anyway, also if they were free to, to go around 
they they can't su support all the burden of this kind of activity uh, right now. Also, we have to think about the Libyan situation right now, which is uh, of an ongoing, uh, very violent conflict still going on. Um, so I would say that these are some some steps that should be taken uh, from from the European countries. Uh, Cedric, maybe you want to continue? Yeah, so um, I mean, of course, um, being part of CI, I will just say we would like um, to not be detained and to be able to conduct our rescue operation. Um, but of course, uh, like uh, Lucia said, this also should be the work made by the EU and the states. So we are only doing those operations because they are not showing responsibility towards a rescue, sea rescue. Um, we would like also maybe the people to be distributed equally and to avoid uh, to put too much pressure on Italy and Malta to have more common sense of uh, the EU. And we would like to have more support and instead of being blocked. And those are, I mean, again, I'm, uh, I'm volunteer and I believe there are much more things to do that uh, Lucia and uh, other experts could uh, could talk about. Um, I also want to say that the citizens are playing an important part and not everything has to be done by the EU. On a local level also a lot of things can be done and a lot of um, support and a lot of um, collaboration can be made. And uh, I mean that's also, yeah, um, as a designer personally I would always prefer to have everybody working together and uh, involving all stakeholders and uh, but I know this is not the reality, so it's much more complex. There are actors on every level, from local to international, um, from the citizen, the NGOs, the institutions. So um, uh, I have no uh, big solution. <laughs> yes, and Simeon, I mean, I know that Alain Fon is also doing a lot of uh, political work. Um, so. Would you still like to comment on this question? Because after this, we will go to the Q&A and answer questions that were asked in the Q&A. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to highlight that it is incredible that we have to talk about sea rescue and how we can force Europe to do sea rescue. This is just not the way how it should be. And uh, Alarm Phone is at the moment doing the work of the RCCs, uh, with it, which is also not the way how it should be. We're just um, volunteers as well. And we are running this um, hotline now. And it's incredible that Europe is doing it like this. And um, of course we can improve maybe uh, the steps taken by Europe, but for me, uh, sea rescue is not a solution for migration issues and that we fight about sea rescue is not a solution for the uh, migration theme or the migration, yeah, for migration to Europe. And um, even if like um, it was five years ago, Italy would cooperate with us and cooperate with the ZAR NGOs as they did in the beginning we would um, witness, as it was th by then, uh, we would wit witness death in the Mediterranean because it's just no safe way to go to Europe. And for now, I would be just happy if Malta would take the phone, if we call them, because in recent cases, they didn't even take the phone. So a uh, rescue uh, cooperation center, which is obliged, obliged to take every call is just not available anymore. And secondly, transparency would be super important because now we do not see what's going on in the Mediterranean and we're just watching tracks of planes and ships and so on. And um, there are people who know what's going on, Frontex, Malta, Italy, there are organizations who know where are those boats, what's happening. And those organizations, we have to say it, they are funded uh, by us, by the civil society, and um, the information they have, um, they are taken as state secure, um, 
um, state secrets. There's, so they, but they are not, they should not be state secret. Everybody should have the availabil av availability to see what's going on in the Met. And um, yeah, but as I said before, this would be just super, super, super small step, but really important. Uh, thank you, Simeon. Now I would like to ask Tatiana. Tatiana Mutinia is my colleague from Transform Europe and she is helping us out with the silent moderation today. Tatiana, would you read out a couple of questions from the Q&A session and then everybody gets the, sound, uh, the, the chance to answer them? Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody. So I have um, selected, so to speak, four questions uh, from the Q&A uh, and I will read them through and then you, you will answer. So one of them is what do you know about the intention of the Spanish state government to forcibly deport 650 Tunisian citizens? Another regards alternative ports. Uh, so uh, since Malta, it's uh, obviously problematic to harbor more migrants and Italy has closed ports uh, for COVID-19. Why are the NGOs not using the ports, uh, alternative ports such as Croatia or Slovenia, uh, which are deemed to be safe? A third question would be, do the crews of Irini operation ships have the competence to participate in search and rescue operations? And finally, and this uh, is a half answered question, I suppose. So it uh, regards the expecta expectations for the post-crisis period. Uh, shall we expect a, a number increase of people on the move and uh, whether Europe is prepared or what type of answers from, the Europe, from Europe could we um, uh, expect? But this, I think, was more or less uh, addressed already. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Um, who would like to take the floor first? Cedric, I see you looking in the camera. Uh, I mean, that's a lot of questions, so um, it would be hard to remember. I didn't write all of them. But one of them, uh, I think I already replied on the chat. So the question was, uh, why are we not bringing the people to Slovenia and Croatia? Because simply we cannot travel there. Uh, it's way too far. If you look at a map, uh, if you go on Google Maps and you check at the, distan the distances, uh, it takes days to go there. Even I mean, I don't, I have never been there, but I would say like at least four days to go there. It's just not safe to travel with so many people on board. So we are actually obliged to go to the closest, safest port, which is Malta or Italy. And we are actually following the instructions from the LCC. So um, we are not taking our own decisions on where we go. We are following instructions from the authorities. And that's basically the work we are doing. Thank you, Cedric. Uh, Lucia, maybe you? Uh, yes, um, just to add something to what Cedric already said, which I totally share. Um, you have to consider that the um, captain of a ship has the responsibility for safety on board. So uh, it is really, really uh, on its both like responsibility and its um, um, technical uh, evaluation, what is safe and what it is not. Um, and that's why, uh, yeah, uh, there is uh, this standoff situation all the time. Um, well. And I don't know about the case of the 60, 150 uh, Tunisians, so I, I can't uh, say a lot. Um, and also um, about the competence, uh, skills uh, that Irini uh, personnel will have on SAR operation, but uh, the issue is that every ship has the duty, every master of a ship has the duty to intervene 
uh, to uh, help uh, people in distress at sea. So uh, anyway, if they are at sea, they, they have to intervene. Otherwise, for example, in the Italian Naval Code, there is a specific crime about non support uh, at sea uh, towards people who are uh, in danger. So uh, it's a duty which is established by national laws, international law. It's even like a, a, a principle which goes beyond written rules uh, uh, in the law of the sea. And expectations? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think uh, that there will be uh, the same, that probably this kind of um, more restrictive measures uh, will be uh, used for a long time. Uh, if we see about Italy, it, they will last at least uh, until the end of the emergency, which doesn't mean uh, like now we are free to more or less uh, go outside and do some stuff, uh, but the emergency situation is still, uh, is still open and declared and uh, for the moment, uh, we will have it at least for uh, for all the summer. So um, it's a, I think it's a bit early to say what will happen after uh, the the crisis from from this perspective. Uh, but there is a possibility, as for as it happens in other political dynamics, that these exceptional measures will be stabilized and also because they were already in the mood, let's say, of uh, the government, at least from the Italian and, and Maltese uh, perspective. Um, I don't see more in the possibility they, they will intervene more uh, according to their duties unless they are forced to do so uh, by a number of actors, which include also uh, civil society for sure. Thank you, Lucia. And Simon, before I give you the floor to answer this question, perhaps an additional question of me taking advantage of my moderator privilege now. I mean, we have seen, for example, from Germany, um, and uh, as it was mentioned before, the city, the, the network of solidarity cities and solidarity municipalities, there is willingness to take people in. I mean, of course, in the, in the case of Malta, Italy, but also Greece, um, another argument is, oh, we cannot let uh, these countries uh, take everybody in, and we need to organize redistribution in the European Union. So uh, here we have the paradoxon of cities declaring the willingness of taking in people, and uh, although the civic society is ready, the local authorities are ready, or for example, Portugal um, just also announced they're willing to take about 1,000 people from the Greek camps at least, but things are not improving anyway. So Simon, perhaps you take this into consideration in your inputs and um, maybe say a couple of words about uh, the network of solidarity cities as well. And the floor is yours. Okay, I'm not sure. Oh. <laughs> um. Actually, I don't know why the states uh, do not want that people go to uh, the municipalities. Mm, I just can speculate as we all do. And my speculation would be that they don't want to lose the power uh, about the situation and they fear of losing the power. Um, when they just make one step towards this um, new and maybe better uh, distribution mechanism, and of course, there are legal arguments with which Lucia could um, possibly tell us. And um, concerning the question of uh, where people can be disembarked, if they can be disembarked in uh, Slovenia or Croatia, I think um, Cedric and, and Lucia answered it already. Um, but in addition to this, uh, Europe is trying to pressure especially Tunisia to take in migrants and Tunisia is refusing this and uh, Europe as we heard already is um, uh, Tunisia is Europe is trying to pressure uh, Tunisia for um, asylum law which would allow it in a way to declare Tunisia as a safe port um, or to disembark people in Tunisia but as my um, as Lucia and Cedric said it's a political question 
um, which needs to be solved. It's not a legal question about where people are disembarked uh, because um, the legal framework um, in the Mediterranean, this is just um, a discussion, um, a start point for discussions, I think, um, as the law of the sea is always discussed again and again, and there are so many diff uh, different op um, ideas about it. And um, so I think we just have to force them to disembark the people in Europe. And if this is a port in um, Malta or Italy in the end, I don't know. And um, concerning the question in, if Malta is capable of taking migrants, um, I would like to highlight that Malta um, had to take in 5,000 migrants over the last five years, um, comparing to Greece, which took more than a million. So of course, Malta is smaller and just an island and not, 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 at, not so much comparable to Greece, but um, just these numbers. Um, show you that it's not a question of if it's possible, but uh, a question of if they want it. I actually also quickly um, wanted to say something about this question on Tunisia. I mean, we will probably say this later again as well, but um, within the past week, uh, we also did uh, two events on this, and today we're also publishing a study actually of um, with Airless North Africa on uh, these discussions that are going on on a Tunisian asylum law, basically. And I think here it's also We've seen in the past years, um, as you mentioned, really attempts to push boats um, back to the Tunisian shore. There was the case of Sarast um, 5, for example, um, where, where um, migrants on a boat have stood on the coast of Tunisia and Tunisia didn't want to take them because it was scared it would set an example, so to say. Uh, for future cases uh, to follow, although the boat was already in the Maltese search and rescue zone before. So uh, here it's also maybe worth another discussion to talk also about the economic um, pressures and the political pressures that are behind this. But I think Lucia also wanted to still say something. Um, yeah, about this, um, I think you have uh, for sure clearer ideas than mine, but uh, just to say, um, why uh, Tunisia is not okay for it, or in most cases uh, for the disembarkation of rescued people. This is uh, this leads us again to the definition of place of safety uh, when uh, there is uh, people fleeing from a country uh, in the in the middle of the of the situation. So. Uh, a place of safety according both to uh, law of the sea and, and human rights and asylum law must be a place where uh, people are not uh, going to suffer uh, any form of violence of uh, inhuman treatments and tor torture but also where they are sure that they won't be refueled uh, so pushed back to another country where they can suffer this so you have to see this uh, principle um, in, in also in this uh, in this way, uh, so for example, when there are Tunisian citizens uh, which are rescued at sea, they may uh, have the need to ask for protection and bring bringing them back to the country they were fleeing uh, from uh, can be a violation of the non-refoulement principle. When it comes to other uh, nationalities, uh, this can't uh, always be the case. But there are, for example, some categories of people who are more in danger than others if they are returned back to uh, Tunisia. Again, uh, a place uh, where they disembark must be also a place where uh, they, their um, right to international protection can be met. And this doesn't only mean that there must be an asylum law, uh, but that this law is actually um, concretely applied and guarantee some standards. Uh, and this is, for the moment, uh, from our perspective, not the case. And if we look at the situation of uh, foreign people uh, in Tunisia, it's uh, often very, very hard and difficult and their basic needs uh, a lot of time are not, uh, are not met and their fundamental rights violated. Uh, that's basically why uh, not Tunisia um, and all the things that also Ines uh, already underlined. 
And for what concern, um, there is something that we try to underline all the time is that um, uh, the use uh, that states do, do of uh, all the search and rescue dynamics, uh, which, is, uh, which is aimed at uh, uh, forcing uh, some, uh, some balances in the European system for what concerns that, that solidarity and the burden sharing of uh, migration to Europe. It's a misuse uh, which often violated, uh, violates uh, migrant rights. And this, uh, at the end of the day, um, means that um, states, Malta, Italy, Greece, um, Spain, all the southern states, uh, which are the first country of arrival for many people who uh, entered Ill illegally or undocumented uh, the European territory, uh, falls under the application of the very famous uh, Dublin regulation, which established uh, which state must be deal with an asylum request. And when people arrive illegally, uh, that means that uh, the first country of arrival is, um, has to take care of the asylum uh, request. And that puts a burden on southern states, and this is what they are, they want to negotiate at the European level. And this is why uh, they put in place this redistribution uh, procedure, which actually I want to underline, it doesn't exist in the European law. These are practices that has been put in place by states uh, during the last two years to try to solve the Dublin problem without amending uh, or reforming the Dublin regulation. But this is a way where, uh, again, uh, rights of people who are interested by these procedures are all the time left apart. Uh, so we see people detained for many months in Malta while waiting for their transfer to the willing states, uh, or people who are forced to be transferred to countries where they, again, uh, there, there are no really good standards for asylum procedures. Um, so, uh, it's a way of doing politics on a European level, uh, but without, in, without taking uh, in account the rights of people who are under them. Um, and they are also, um, for the moment, not really useful because they are, uh, they, 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 it's, there is a small amount of people uh, we are talking about. So, not something that really affects the systems uh, in Italy or in Greece or, or in Malta. Thanks. Um, also, just um, in the going through the Q&A, there was also a comment uh, when we discussed the autonomous arrivals uh, from borderline Europe and they said that they have been collecting also arrival numbers and they had uh, 545 people who arrived in May by themselves, uh, mainly to Lampedusa. Only three boats came from Libya, all the other boats came from Tunisia, but also with sub-Saharan migrants on board. The people in Italy are mostly coming from Bangladesh, Ivory Coast, Sudan, Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, Somalia, Guinea, Mali, and Egypt, and in total they had 4,237 people who arrived from uh, January to May. Um, we are slowly uh, reaching um, at the end of the discussion, but there was um, a last question that uh, just came in, I think, which was, uh, would you like the mandatory quotas for redistribution of migrants to be imposed by the EU and what redistribution mechanism would work? The migrants would with high probability not accept countries of the Eastern EU as their future home as we learned from the past. But I think the question is, um, yeah, on mandatory quotas of redistribution, whether this would be a, a solution within the EU according to you. Yeah. No, for me, but it's my personal uh, opinion. Uh, no, I think that the solution would be uh, to reform the Dublin regulation. And the ideal solution would be also to take into account the needs and will of people uh, who arrive uh, to Europe. Um, so, uh, and this is maybe a, a bit idealistic. Uh, but I don't think that uh, establishing like, 
Establishing a system uh, for redistribution would probably in the short term solve, and this would be good, of course, uh, the problem of disembarkation. Okay, so from this side, uh, it would be uh, a good thing for all people who will be rescued uh, from now on in the future. But um, to accept that this uh, practice becomes systematic as it is, and more like on the model of the relocation seat mechanism that was um, applied uh, in 2016 uh, for people who arrived to Greece and Italy, uh, that wouldn't uh, guarantee uh, rights of migrants at all. And because the, there was, back then, there were two decisions by the European Council regulating a bit the procedure. Uh, so it was a bit more formalized than uh, the re re redistribution we see now. Um, but still, for example, a person uh, who had to go to Germany, um, pass through different procedures than a person who had to pass to go to France or to Portugal. And uh, um, they, it, it was not possible to know about which procedure it was, which were the rights of the, the person. They couldn't have the record of their interviews. They couldn't, they weren't notified the decision of transfer uh, or the rejection more than the decision of or the rejection of the transfer. Uh, so you, they, they, they moved in a, in a space which is not the, the space of rights. It's more like a space of um, undefined programs, mechanism, which didn't even establish um, a duty for the states to actually carry out the, the transfer. Because sometimes the transfer was something that had been wanted by the, by the asylum seeker, but uh, couldn't be achieved and there, were, there was no way under Dublin procedure, if you have to be transferred to another country and you think it's not fair, you can go in front of a judge and make the judge assess the legitimacy of this transfer. We, don't, we maybe don't like the, the rules established by Dublin, but at least you, you, you have a space of rights. Um, Why now? No, and, and the, the idea that has been um, uh, forwarded for now about redistribution are more like the relocation system. And so I don't think it's a winning situation. At the same time, of course, from a practical, immediate point of view, it would allow probably a, a, a faster procedure for uh, rescue and disembarkation, which is also important, of course. But from a political perspective, I think that it would be, it, won't, it wouldn't be a victory. Uh, okay, uh, I would like to um, answer one question concerning why Alarm Phone was not sharing or is not sharing so much evidence with uh, public prosecutors or with courts and so on and so forth. Um, because there was a question about a trial, I don't know which one, which was dismissed because Alarm Phone um, didn't share evidence. Um, we, uh, from an alarm from perspective, we are first, um, our first um, goal or aim is to protect the migrants. And um, if this is not guaranteed in a legal process, we, we cannot contribute in this because um, we um, observed a lot of cases where migrants were in the end charged for many years, like the El Blue case, if you remember it, uh, which is still ongoing on Malta, or cases where people are chased as smugglers and have to go to um, prison for long term. And of course, we do have a lot of evidence and we do have a lot of information about what's going on in the Met and um, we do share it uh, with trusted lawyers and with trusted uh, people we know on the long term and um, but um, only if we are sure it cannot in endanger any migrant or any people involved in this which is um, uncertain at the moment because um, there are so many ongoing investigations against uh, search and rescue organization and against uh, migrants um, which makes it uh, difficult to have uh, legal procedures. 
but there are legal procedures and if we can contribu contribute without endangering the migrants, we do. And maybe Lucia uh, can add something from a legal perspective, I don't know. No. Uh, thank you, Simon. Thank you for taking up the question. We're about uh, to read it out loud uh, as well. I mean, we're coming slowly to an end. Um, it's always difficult to stop these discussions because uh, no matter how long they are, it always seems that uh, it's not, it hasn't been enough, right? So perhaps I take one minute um, to tell you my conclusions. Um, sea Rescue at Sea has to be supported. Um, it is an obligation um, towards people that are risking their lives and people that are in danger. On our side, the side of Transform, we will continue visiting the borders of Europe, but also different countries in Europe and asking the question, how are people treated, migrants and refugees in these countries, and um, try to make um, actually the conditions in which they have to survive a lot of the times uh, more visible than they are now. And uh, before I give um, to Ines uh, also the floor for uh, some closing words, two things. Um, one, I mean, we keep uh, we keep talking about um, about um, action that is taking place in here and now. Uh, but as it was mentioned already before, sea rescue is not a solution to migration or. Um, um, or uh, being solidarious with migrants in your country is not uh, a solution, of course, uh, to migration. But on the other hand, migration is not the problem. If it was a problem, it, it would have a solution. The problem really starts in the countries of origin for these people. We have people fleeing war, fleeing persecution, fleeing also unemployment or poverty. And sooner rather than later, the way um, the industry keeps polluting the planet. We're going to have millions of people uh, on the way searching for food, shelter, and uh, clear water and environment. So uh, if we really, really want to treat people good, we have to also address the reasons that force people leaving their homes and taking the risk uh, to come to Europe. Um, yes, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Tatiana, for, uh, for doing the online moderation. And Ines, I would like you to close the discussion, please. Thanks. Um, yes, so also on this note, um, thanks everyone um, for this very important uh, webinar that we did today. And I think that, um, yes, we did discuss a lot about uh, the, the central med and so on, but at the same time, uh, the safety um, of migrants and so on. It's not just safety of migrants crossing the Mediterranean, it's also of those, for example, crossing the desert uh, to Tunisia and so on, whose situation is even more precarious and where we don't, for example, don't even have all of these systems in place, like sea rescue vessels and planes locating <laughs> persons in distress and so on. So yes, um, for us, um, for uh, from this North um, African perspective as well, it's, I think, as also already mentioned, the question is also closely tied to the economic question at the same time. And um, I do agree that it is um, important to, so to say, create also um, the alternative um, perspectives and, and, and tie this question of why do people actually have to leave in the first place um, to much broader questions that have to be asked in the first place. And also just um, remember, that um, we still are faced with a system where we force people to, in the first place, come this way through the Mediterranean, through the desert and so on, because we do not allow it to them in any other way in most cases. So um, yes, uh, thanks to all. Um, I also um, briefly wanted to uh, mention, maybe Katarina, you also want to mention if you have um, events um, that are uh, coming up by Transform. Yeah. So um, for us, um, we are slowly concluding with LLS our um, uh, Ramadan um, migration web series. However, you can stream um, our discussions that we had on the situation of migrants in detention camps in Morocco, Algeria, Libya, uh, and Tunisia. Um, in our on our Facebook page, um, as well as the um, presentation of a study on the implications of declaring Tunisia a safe country for origin 
and of the, these discussions on a new asylum system in Tunisia, which is a quite difficult question to answer as we saw today, because on the one hand, yes, you should create um, good conditions for refugees in the respective country legally, but on the other hand, then um, with the danger that Tunisia is becoming a new um, externalized border of the EU and cannot really comply, so to say, with, um, with, with, with this law and with the provisions that, um, the basic, uh, basic provisions that should be, should be in place uh, for refugees in the country. So thank you for everyone. And uh, Katerina, maybe if you still haven't done <laughs> anything, okay. And, yes, and the link also by everybody, if um, you want to share uh, still your links um, or any hashtags, as you said before, Cedric, for example, um, um, for, for the campaign or how somebody can get involved, then I think maybe we can close with this. Then the last thing, what I forgot to say is that we have been recording this session. We're going to make it available in the next one, two days on YouTube. And you can find our information both in the Transform page, but also in the RLS uh, Tunis page. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for taking the time. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, Cedric. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> <laughs>